A little bit of confession uh, from me this morning. My office, uh, my desk in particular, but my office in general is quite messy. There are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, one of them is that after years in uh, corporate cubes that were quite sterile in the environment, uh, I like to have my office be a cozy place. So in addition to all of the books that are on my shelves, I have all kinds of little knickknacks. I have toys for kids to play with in there in my office and uh, all sorts of other little remembrances. Another reason that my office tends to get messy is that there are things that don't have a permanent home uh, around here. I have a box of confirmation notebooks and things that I drag out every time we have a confirmation class. I have boxes of Thrivent t-shirts that I haven't had a chance to give away yet. And so those end up sitting on my floor in various places. Sometimes we have things like uh, care packages we're putting together or other uh, service projects and some of those things end up in my office. Other times we create things together, whether it's a project in VBS or it's uh, some sort of art that's part of worship. And when we have those things, <coughs> excuse me, it's hard for me to just get rid of those things because they're tied into that time that we were together creating this thing in a space of community and worship together. So my office itself is generally pretty cluttered. My desk is uh, just piles of paper. I know where everything is and I also know how those things get there. I may be uh, in the middle of creating some kind of uh, document and have all of the research there with me. Uh, sometimes I'll get a piece of mail and look at it and know that I don't have time to get to it right now so it gets set on my desk. Sometimes it's a book that I'm not quite done with or a book I want to remember to take with me. And all of these things end up piling up because at the end of the day, when uh, all of my people work and, and time is done, when I have an opportunity to get home and be home, uh, I usually take that rather than spend it cleaning up my office. So my office is messy, my desk is messy, and it is all a mess of my own making. But I ask you today, I want you to imagine that if I were to go into my office here uh, after worship and say, go to step around the rocking chair that's in there and catch my foot on it and fall and sprain my wrist. If I were to come to you all and say, I just fell in my messy office, is this some kind of judgment that God has levied upon me because of my uh, inability to keep order in my office? My guess would be that most of you would say, no, pastor, uh, that mess is of your own making and it's your own fault that you have created an environment that caused you to slip and fall. Today we hear a passage from the prophet Amos and it begins with this doom sort of foreboding language of alas, the day of the Lord will be darkness. And this idea of the day of the Lord does carry with it this sense that there is a day of judgment. Now I have found plenty of evidence in scripture that God's gift of life and God's gift of grace is something that we can experience right now, not just off at some heavenly end time. And what this passage makes me uh, think about is that maybe God's judgment is something that we also can experience right now, just not at some great end time. And if you read the prophet of Amos, there is plenty of judgment there. When you start at the beginning of the book, uh, Amos tells us all of the things that the, the people of Israel have done uh, to sort of move away from God. They have uh, worshipped other gods. They have uh, moved away from the commandments. They have sold the righteous people for money. They have trampled on the poor. They have built strongholds to hide within as they oppress other people. They have taken bribes and they have turned to violence and they have shut up the prophets because they don't want to hear from God. And they have uh, had robbery and all sorts of other terrible behaviors that have drifted away from the way that God would have them live. Now, when you talk about the commandments in particular, and, uh, and they were accused uh, by the prophet of moving away from the commandments, those commandments were a gift from God to help the people live together in relationship with God and then to live as a community of people together. So that to the extent that they got away from those commandments, they begin to move into some space where their life as a, as a community, their life as a people is not a healthy one. It's violent, it's got economics that are unjust, its leaders, if you just read through the books of Kings, are all over the place uh, leading them into false worship. There's a good one every now and then, but mostly they are a volatile group that's trying to make foreign allegiances that bounce all over the place as they try to protect their power and protect their space. And so as they live in all of this uh, sort of chaos of leadership and unjust economics, it's no wonder that eventually that, uh, that's an unsustainable situation. So when we come to today's passage and it says, 
the day of the Lord is not some great light day. It's going to be a day of darkness and a day of judgment. It's not that it's some far off thing. It's that the way the people have chosen to live together has started to crumble and fall apart. It's not a healthy, sustainable community that can carry on. And eventually this is what happens. The very foreign powers that they try to make allegiances with. Uh, uh, Syria comes and carries away the people of Israel into exile. And then later, the Babylonians come and carry away the kingdom of Judah. God's people are taken away because their way of living has crumbled apart. And we might call that God's judgment. And the prophet does indeed call that God's judgment. But I wonder if it's not so much that God is causing this to happen so much as God is letting uh, the mess of their own making take its course. Because God does give us free will. And so the people of Israel have moved away from God. They have made those choices. And the mess that they end up in is a mess of their own making. And so if their mess is of their own making, we might today find and ask, what does the prophet speak to us? Early on in this text, it's after it says, alas, the, great, the day of the Lord is near, it says, it will be like when you try to run away from lion and meet a bear. And I tell you, that verse really settled with me this week when I think about the terrible choices that our parents have had to make uh, relative to school in this pandemic. Do I send my kid to school where there may be more exposure to the virus and some health concerns, or do I keep them home where they're really struggling to be locked up and disconnected from their friends, running away from the lion toward the bear or away from the bear toward the lion? Church has had to make similar hard decisions, right, where there doesn't seem to be a good answer and we're running away from one thing and toward another. Then there's this, the next bit says that you lean on the wall in your house and get bit by a snake. Sometimes we build fortresses around ourselves and, and communities and just focus so much on safety and security only to find out that being locked in like that isn't the safest thing for us either. And we end up in places where maybe not bitten by a snake, but bitten by uh, depression and other things because we're disconnected from people. And so the prophet starts off in a way that may sound familiar to us, but then we might ask some of the same questions that the prophet asked earlier in the book. How are we doing at keeping God's commandments? And we could start with the Ten Commandments and say, you know, we're supposed to love the Lord our God as God alone and not use the Lord's name in vain. It's really a question of where do we put our trust? And we could look all around us in our culture and see how often we put our trust in ourselves, how often we put our trust in capitalism, how much we put our trust in our politics and our elections to be some kind of savior for us. As we move through the commandments, we uh, get to the commandment about Sabbath. How good are we at slowing down and resting in the Lord? That doesn't seem like one we settle into very often. Maybe we honor our parents well, and maybe we steer clear, most of us, of murder and thievery and adultery. Uh, but then we get to the, the commandment that says, don't bear false witness. And we think about uh, the ways that we speak to one another and how well are we doing at speaking well of one another collectively. And that's when we can just look back at the last many months and say, not so great. And then the last two commandments about coveting, uh, Martin Luther says these are there for uh, all of the people that look at the rest of the commandments and say, oh, I've kept them all perfectly and I am upright and wonderful. And Luther says, nope, this last one catches everybody up because we all envy the things that others have. So just with those 10 commandments, that's not even getting into Jesus talking about the greatest commandments to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. We can see that we like those people of Israel, do not perfectly align ourselves with God's vision for the world. But then the prophet could ask us some other questions. How are we doing at caring for the poor? Are our economics uh, full of disparity? The statistic that I keep talking about that I can't get out of my mind is that 70% of the people in Orange County here, the children in school are on free and reduced lunch, meaning they don't have enough to eat. And those 70% of kids in this county live in a community that also has some opulent wealth. And that disparity just doesn't seem like something that can carry on forever. Our housing market here is ridiculously expensive and there are those who have and those who have not. So if the prophet were to ask, are your economics stable and are they providing for all the people? We'd have to say no. Then we could go and look at, uh, in, the prophet talks about oppression and who is it that gets oppressed around us. And this starts to get into some uncomfortable territory for people. Uh, we can't even have uh, conversations about racism and immigration with one another without getting into fights, let alone getting to a place where we're acting and moving in spaces so that justice can be in our world. So if we take the prophet seriously, right, we start to get to places where we might 
get a little bit uncomfortable with some of the accusations that come our way. And like those people of Israel, we may have to ask ourselves, is this a mess of our own making? Are we complicit in getting us to a place where we have injustice and, and struggle all around us? And is it something that's sustainable over the long term? And if we look to their example, we might say no. But that's not the hardest part of what we hear from Amos today. All of the lead up and all of the, the accusations about the people moving away from God land in this place where God judges their worship. We're told that the Lord hated their sacrifices and their festivals, that God did not want to hear their worship. And the reason was because the people's worship was empty. They were trampling on the poor and disconnected from justice and they weren't living the way God wanted them to. And yet they came and came to worship and acted as if they were. And God says, no, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in you living your faith out and that all of that should be worship. You come with your whole self and all of it being a sacrifice that you bring to me. That's a hard one to contemplate in this season of pandemic. What spirit do we bring to our worship and how comfortable do we get in our worship spaces, whether that's here or online? And in that comfort of worship, are we disconnected from the disparity that surrounds us? Are we disconnected from the injustices that we see? And it's into that that the prophet speaks about this dark day, right? This place of judgment, that the mess of our own making has gotten to this space where it becomes untenable. But there is good news in this text. The very last bit of it says that uh, after talking about this dark day of the Lord and the people's empty worship, God says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. There are two different images there of water. Water that rolls down to me brings to mind things like waterfalls and rapids. Those are places where the water gets churned up and stirred up. And when I think about injustice in the world, when we settle into a place of complacency and comfort, right? When we think we're doing okay and the other people out there that aren't, right? That's their own problem. And we come to a place of worship and want to be comfortable in God and comfortable with the status quo. Justice that rolls down like waters tends to stir us up, right? And make us uncomfortable. And that's where when we get into some of those trickier places of conversations that we might call political, but really deal with life and death issues for people, when that makes us uncomfortable, that might just be a holy thing. If I you know, wanted to make you all uncomfortable, it's not that hard, right? I just have to start talking about the way that racism are, uh, is part of our culture and how we can move forward with it and talk about some of the other issues of healthcare and immigration and so many other things. And we start to get, right, like, why are we talking about that? And maybe that's just what it means for God's justice to roll down like waters is that it stirs that dis-ease up in us. But then when that dis-ease is stirred up in us, it gets us an opportunity to grow and to learn and to be transformed. Which brings us to the second part of the water imagery. The first bit is the, the water that stirs up, but the second bit is righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Streams are, are gentle, right? Like that's the imagery that comes to mind, that there's this stream that settles and comforts. So we've got water that stirs up the status quo when it's not working, and then streams that settle and comfort those that need comfort. And initially that may be the people that are on the wrong side of society, right? The people that are left out and abused and stamped on. LGBTQ youth who are homeless because their families have disowned them. People that are struggling because they're people of color. People are struggling because they, they live in spaces of immigration and uh, domestic violence and all kinds of other stuff, right? Those streams of God's living water that can comfort are important. But on the other side, right, is those waters that stir up. And we need both of those things. And the reason that I say this is good news all the way around is that when we get stirred up, we then become people that begin to see the world maybe a little bit the way God sees it. And when we see that injustice and when we see that struggle, we now have an opportunity to be settled by those streams that transform us and turn us more into the image of Jesus who we are called to follow. When we talk about these waters, Amos isn't talking about Jesus, right? Amos is just talking about the people of God that are right there in front of him and their struggles and the mess that they have made and the way that God is going to come into that darkness, meet them there and make them new. And that's very much the way that we talk about Jesus, that he meets us on the cross in our darkness, in the messes that we have made. But then in the waters of baptism, right, we, are, we die with him, but we rise with him and we can talk about those waters as being a little bit inconvenient. Sometimes they cause and, and stir up in us things that make us uncomfortable, but it's because Jesus calls us into places of newness. 
And then we get comforted by those same waters that help us to adjust to that new place that Jesus is calling us. And Martin Luther talks about baptism as something that we remember every day again and again, which brings me back to my messy office. Uh, it is always messy, but occasionally someone comes in and, and there's a, a prompting, right? A drive that gets me to clean off the whole desk, uh, get recycled what I can, clean up the boxes, put stuff in the closet and get it back into a place where it is orderly and tidy. It's new, it's transformational. It doesn't last very long all the time because life happens and I get back to my old habits, but then that prompting comes again and again. And this is the way it works with these waters of God. They continually come to stir us up, bring us forgiveness, and then comfort us and send us out as people full of grace to share with the world. God trusting that working through us, we can bring that transformation and bring God's love to everyone we meet. Uh, whether they need to be stirred up or comforted themselves, we're all part of that journey as we go together as the body of Christ. Amen.